China makes history, landing a probe on the far side of the moon. We will discuss the importance of the Chang'e 4 mission. And Alexa, what else is on the show? Anand, we will look ahead at new technologies for 2019. Hello, I am Alexa, and this is The Heat. Hey, that's my job. I'm Anand Naidu, and this is The Heat. Scientists are describing it as a breakthrough achievement. The Chinese probe Chang'e 4 became the first to land on the so-called dark side of the moon, the side that's never visible from Earth. It's now positioned in the moon's oldest and deepest crater, an area scientists believe is ripe for exploration with samples here that could offer insights into the moon's origin and evolution. Landing a spacecraft on the far side wasn't a mission without challenges. Since the moon blocks direct communications, China had to first put a satellite in orbit to relay signals. The key reason for this successful landing is the relay satellite which was launched in May. Its smooth transit and operation provided communication between the Earth and the probe. It can be said that China has created a revolutionary technology for lunar exploration. The far side of the moon was first photographed in 1959 by the Soviet space probe Luna 3. In 1968, the United States Apollo 8 astronauts became the first to see the far side with the naked eye, but until now, all manned and unmanned soft landings have taken place on the near side of the moon, making the Chinese mission truly historic. To discuss the importance of this landing, we welcome from Beijing Yang Yuguang. He is a professor at the China Aerospace Science and Industry Corporation. And joining us from Austin, Texas, Stephen Clark is an editor for Spaceflight Now. Thanks to both of you for joining us. Yang Yuguang, let me start with you. This was quite a feat, uh, landing a probe on the far side of the moon. How long did this project take to develop? And exactly how did this craft leave Earth and land on the other side of the moon? Uh, you know, that the terrain on the far side of the moon is quite different from that on the uh, near side of the moon. On the near side of the moon, you can see many uh, mares, all the seas we called. Uh, it's really flat. On the far side of the moon, there are more highlands, craters, and mountains. So uh, the shape is more stiff than the near side. Uh, with this uh, condition, we need to optimize the landing procedure of Chang'e 4. The landing procedure is optimized and some uh, parameters were changed. And uh, this time, uh, we go a very more steep uh, shape curve uh, or the trajectory uh, to reduce its circumlunar speed. And then we almost uh, slow the, uh, going down uh, perpendicularly uh, to the lunar surface. And finally, we success successfully landed on the Von Kármán crater in the South Pole Atkin Basin. Stephen, how is this uh, development being seen here in the United States? I think this uh, landing was certainly a, a coup uh, scientifically and geopolitically for China. Uh, uh, there's been no mission to land on the far side of the moon by the United States or any other country to this point. Um, and I think a lot of U.S. scientists uh, have long wanted to have a mission to this region on the moon, the South Pole Aiken Basin region in the southern hemisphere of the, uh, the lunar far side because I think that is, is one of the oldest uh, ancient impact sites uh, in the solar system. So scientists think they can learn a whole lot about uh, the conditions three or four billion years ago um, when the planets were starting to form, when a lot of objects were uh, flying about the solar system, impacting planets, and it was a very chaotic period in the solar system's history. And scientists here have long wanted a mission to go to this region to do some geologic exploration to collect some samples and see what the solar system might have been like uh, during that era when life was just starting to take hold on Earth and maybe see if life uh, took hold on other planets. Yang Yuguang, how long will this uh, probe be functional on the other side of the moon? And what are the kinds of information that it will be sending us uh, over the next few years? Uh, well, you know that we have many payloads, uh, about eight payloads on the lander and the rover. Uh, during the next uh, months and years, we know that uh, it, it has a landing camera and a terrain camera, which is similar to that of the Chang'e 3. But uh, this time, uh, we have an instrument called the low-frequency spectrometer. 
uh, which will perform a radio astronomy study on the far side of the moon. You know that uh, uh, on the uh, on the far side of the moon, there is a very good condition that the uh, the radio waves from the Earth are all blocked. So there is no, essentially speaking, there is no different uh, disturbance from the Earth. Uh, it is a very ideal place to perform this kind of radio astronomy study. Well, you see that uh, uh, Chang'e 3 has also has some astronomy study, but mainly on optical, optical ones. And also, uh, we have uh, some cooperation with the German side, uh, with the Germany side, uh, have a, a neutron and a dosimetry uh, measurement uh, device uh, on board the lander. Uh, this lander, uh, this device will tell us some uh, environmental parameters of the uh, far on, on surface of the far side of the moon. On the rover, uh, uh, the same as Chang'e 3, uh, we have the lunar penetrating radar and also uh, have the uh, panoramic uh, camera, which can get images and also uh, get the information from uh, below the surface of the, uh, of the moon. Uh, this will be very meaningful and very important for the future because you know that the far side of the moon is, uh, have many resources for human beings for the future potential uh, exploitation. So this kind of device uh, tells us the environment of the uh, far side of the moon and it is possible to uh, be helpful for the future potential lunar base on the, uh, on the far side of the moon. Stephen, I'm going to go to something else now. And there was another big achievement in space over the last few days. Uh, over the new year, NASA's New Horizons uh, captured an image of Ultima Thule, a 32-kilometer uh, piece of rock, uh, which we were able to see. It's right at the edge of our solar system. In fact, I think this is the furthest that uh, a probe has gone in, in space. Um, what will this tell us? Well, NASA's New Horizons mission uh, flew by uh, Ultima Thule, which is in the Kuiper Belt, which is a sort of a donut-shaped uh, ring of, of uh, tiny, ob tiny worlds, tiny objects uh, beyond the orbit of Neptune. And you're right, this was the most distant object ever explored by a spacecraft. And scientists think this region of the solar system is uh, populated by the building blocks of the planets, uh, bits of chunk and bits of uh, rock and ice that coalesced to form the planets uh, four and a half billion years ago. And these yeah. objects out in that part of the solar system never had a chance to uh, merge with each other, to collide with each other, to build up a planet. And these are the leftovers from that very, very earliest part of the solar system's history. So if sci scientists want to know what it was like uh, in that time, uh, four and a half billion years ago, how the planets formed, the mechanisms uh, the, that formed the planets. And these, by exploring these types of objects, four uh, billion miles away from us, uh, scientists hope to learn about that part of the solar system's history and how the planets formed. Yang Yuguang, the Chang'e 4 probe was jointly designed uh, with Germany and with Sweden. Can we expect to see more of this kind of international cooperation in the future? You can see that uh, this time we have the payload from uh, Germany, we have the payload from Sweden. Uh, as I mentioned, the, uh, the low frequency spectrometer is a cooperation with Netherlands. Uh, to my view, that in the future, the deep space uh, explorations, international cooperation will be an inevitable trend. We can see that in recent years, uh, it, it almost has no exception that the deep space, pr uh, deep space probes uh, of these kind of uh, space capable nations like uh, China, Europe, and the uh, US uh, have international payloads. And also, I think this is a very uh, good measure to reduce the code and also re reduce the threshold for the decision makers to perform uh, or start these kind of projects. And also, it can benefit uh, multiple countries and also benefit the whole world. Stephen, you know, as you've been telling us, uh, these uh, expeditions into deep space tell us more about our own planet, you know, how this planet uh, came into being. But we're also hearing and we also see in the United States uh, what's been called the militarization of space. Um, what, what is this about, the militarization of space? Could we see a race out in space to get some kind of mili military superiority? Well, I think the militaries of uh, the United States and Russia and China and any other uh, power, uh, powerful nation have always had an interest in space. Um, it, it is true that uh, uh, in this time there is a lot, uh, there are more objects in space than ever before, so it's more difficult to track what each object is doing. Um, one key facet of, of uh, 
what the U.S. is interested in right now is what's called space situational awareness. And that is making sure that uh, uh, objects in space don't collide with one another because that can uh, uh, create more space junk, which creates threats to um, all objects in space, uh, military satellites, civilian satellites, commercial satellites. So I, I think the military has always had an interest in space. And uh, the, the U.S. Uh, military right now sees uh, threats to their, to their spacecraft, uh, growing threats to the spacecraft, both uh, in a kinetic sense, meaning uh, uh, potentially another object taking out one of their military satellites, or in the cyber sense, uh, worried about jamming and hacking. So uh, there, is, there is growing concern about, uh, about threats to military satellites uh, by the United States government right now. But I think we have to be careful because the military has always been in space since the late 1950s, in fact. And um, so the, the military has always had an interest in space for communications, for navigation, for surveillance. And uh, I think we have to be careful to, to really um, uh, make too much of the milita militarization of space because there's always been a militarization of space for 60 years. Yang Yuguang, how uh, ambitious is the Chinese space program? What does the future look like? Uh, of course, you know that we have a very large-scale space program. Uh, the leaders of China has mentioned many times that we China now is a big country in space field. Last year, we achieved the top one in the numbers of launches, orbital launches, uh, for the first time in history. But still, we are not an advanced country uh, in space field. So the future, we still have a long way to go. Uh, for, for, for this goal, we have multiple uh, details, uh, detailed purposes. Uh, one is that uh, for the manned space uh, programs, we should have a permanent uh, uh, low Earth orbit space station. Uh, it will be the National Space Laboratory and also a very good platform for the international cooperation. For the deep space missions, we will perform uh, the sample return missions after this Chang'e 4 mission. And if, in the future, we will also have a Mars mission which will combine uh, lander and orbiter and the rover together. In the future, we also plan to go to Jupiter or other uh, outer, plan uh, outer solar system planets. Uh, so uh, we have this kind of exploration programs. And for the space applications, we will continue our constructions on the uh, Beidou navigation satellite system, which will be a global one. And also, the golfing or the high definition uh, program, we will have better images, either reader images or uh, optical images, uh, benefit the national economy. Uh, and uh, also, we have other uh, communication satellites. And uh, in recent years, I should emphasize that the commercial space uh, activities are growing very fast. So, in the future, it will be a very important part of China's space activities. Stephen, the uh, Chinese Chang'e 4 project has had, I guess, one unintended consequence. It's resurrect resurrected a famous piece of music by Pink Floyd called The Dark Side of the Moon. Uh, but what is less known is that there was another famous rock star called Brian May, who was an astrophysicist. He's a musician with the group Queen. Uh, he had some involvement with the New Horizons project. What can you tell us about that? Yes, uh, uh, Brian May is a contributing scientist to the New Horizons project. Um, and he, he, one of his specialties is in creating stereo imagery. So he creates a sort of three-dimensional imagery that you can put on some special glasses and see the shape of objects, and actually it looks like you're there. Uh, you, uh, if you put on these, uh, you know, if you've seen an IMAX movie, for example, you put on these glasses, it looks like you can reach out and touch something. And uh, so uh, um, he's created some, some stereo, stereo so imagery of this uh, object, Ultima Thule, and, and other bodies throughout the solar system. And uh, so, so he's part of the science team for New Horizons. He's there helping process images, create imagery from the data coming back from New Horizons. And he also released a new song uh, uh, at New Year's, uh, at New Year's uh, as the probe was flying by Ultima Thule, uh, sort of celebrating uh, the, the, uh, the uh, ethos of discovery and of exploration. And uh, he released that song in conjunction with the flyby just after New Year's uh, here in the US. Uh, uh, on New Year's Day. Well, thanks to both of you for being with us, Stephen. We do have uh, part of that song. On that note, we're going to take a break and leave you listening to Brian May's New Horizons.